in the Lord. So uh, we've been in this discussion, <laughs> this is going to be two weeks now, it's going to stretch out a little bit, uh, about our vision, vision correction. And a couple, uh, last week I was talking about how the king speaks. Jesus, the king, uh, presents himself. He turns his attention away from uh, the crowd, or not necessarily away from the crowd, but he's talking generally, his last address warning his disciples, warning the folks of the, the leaven of the, the Pharisees and the scribes, the hypocrisy of the Herodians and all of those things. And then he, he like a laser, focuses directly on the, the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees. And then he delivers a series of eight woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. So we're going to be in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 23, and if you uh, don't have a Bible in the seat rack in front of you, grab one of those Bibles, and, and it should be on page 756. 756. Have you ever been locked out of your house? Oh, man, man, I have been. I've been locked out of my house. And uh, <clears throat> is that up on the screen? No, I got a picture of what that looks like. Uh, when you're locked out of your house, right? That's that, see that lady looking at her keys, but she can't get in. Uh, that's just horrible feeling, isn't it? And you know the drill, right? You knock on the door, you ring the doorbell, and it, hopefully someone's home and they can deliver you. Uh, and obviously, by, you've forgotten the garage door code or whatever the case may be. You're on vacation now, you're locked out of the, uh, the hotel, whatever it is. Um, and so you're locked out. Now, why are you locked out, right? If you're locked out of your home, what is the problem? Well, you've lost, you, have, you do not possess the key, right? You don't have the key to get in, or else you would use it and go in. And so, uh, last week, as, as we gathered, we talked about the key, right? How many of you remember, just a little way review, what was the key that we talked about last week out of Revelation chapter 3? The key of... Duh. Duh. Anybody... David, yes, somebody got it. David, yeah, so we talked about the key of David, right? <clears throat> and this great key that was given <clears throat> to Eliakim and in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 22. And we talked about how the Pharisees, right, they got in the way <clears throat> of doors that God wanted to open. God wanted doors open and, and then they, they got in the way, right? They themselves were child, children of the devil. They did not want to go in. They didn't want to enter and acknowledge the king. But the problem that Jesus was having was not only was that an issue that they had, but their disobedience, right? Their hypocrisy, their hard-heartedness was a blocking others from entering into the kingdom. And man, this was a, this was a problem uh, for Jesus. So he called them out on that. And, uh, and uh, he was wanting uh, some folks to enter the kingdom. So we talked about that. And, and uh, <clears throat> last week when we were in verse 13, that number of rebellion. So they shut go doors that God wanted open. He said in verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So we concluded last week <clears throat> with an example of that key that opens the door, and uh, that is the example of Revelation 3, 7, Isaiah 22, and that key is a key of faith, that faithfulness that per is personified, of course, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, who is the one who, at the end of the previous chapter of Matthew 22, has shut the mouths of the Pharisees because they are afraid to acknowledge that he is who he says he is. And so uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy. He's the son of David. So Jesus is the, the door. We talked about that as well in John chapter 10. He's the key. Uh, we see that in Revelation chapter 3. And then in verse 20 of Revelation chapter 3, we see another image, uh, which I'm not going to take the time to turn to, of Jesus, or another revelation, let's say, because it's Revelation chapter 2, to the church of Laodicea. And we find that Jesus Christ, after we get through verse 18 of Revelation 3, we get to verse 20, then Jesus Christ says, uh, behold, I stand at the door, right? And he calls our church to come, and every church, everyone in the church, to come and sup with him. Jesus says, hey, come on in and fellowship. He desires uh, us to have a two-way street, right? Uh, he wants us to come to him, but he wants to be in us. And so there's a fellowship that transpires, and, and so faith opens that door. But when we grow cold and we have an eye problem, not an eye problem, but an eye problem, talked about that last week, it causes uh, a problem with us even being able to open the door. And this time Jesus is knocking, saying, hey, could you open the door? I'd like in. I may be the door, and I may be the key to the door, but I just need you to open it. 
Would you come and sup? Would you fellowship with me? Now, this is particularly dealing with this church age that we live in today. That is exactly the the admonition, Revelation chapter 3 and verses 18 through 20, really 17 through 20. Think about it. How many of us today have entered or extended into or had a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ? It is possible that you have gotten up this morning, and if you don't know the Lord, you probably haven't had a conversation, so I get that. But I'm talking about folks that, yeah, you're here, you're saved, you're, you're working, but maybe you just haven't even today gotten up and said, hey, good morning, Jesus. Uh, uh, it's good to be saved. It's good to be in your kingdom. I want your perspective on life. Uh, help me with this. I'm going to engage with some people today. Fill me with your spirit. Uh, reading through the Bible. Speak to my heart. Uh, whatever it may be. I mean, really just had an ex- a period where you have, even this morning, fellowshiped, supped, connected in a real tangible, well, as tangible as spiritual gets, in a tangible way with the Lord. You all know what I'm talking about? Right, because you have those moments, I hope, or I'm going to go back to the gospel message. But I mean, if you're saved, right, that's what's what happens. You get, you get, yeah, I'm saved. But there's a relationship that gets established, and then you start supping, you start working in the Word, you start knowing that God is speaking to you, and you're like, you're engaging in this fellowship. It's possible that you came in even this morning and you haven't really even fellowshiped with the Lord. And uh, I'm not trying to lay guilt trip on you, but that's, that's, you know why we get that way? Oftentimes, because this culture we're in, the communication age, I've been talking about on Reve- in Revelation study, Daniel chapter 12, right? It's, it's, we're bombarded with so many other things to fill up our mind, to occupy us. And so we have to be intentional. Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. He's still standing at the door and he's knocking, saying, hey guys, I, I want to sup with you. I am the door, I am the key. W- would, you, would you open the door? It's open. Just come and and allow me to to fellowship with you. In John chapter 20, you know, Jesus spoke with Thomas there and he said, stick your finger in my hand, stick your hand in my side. And and of course he did that. And when he did, he came to faith in Christ. He said, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said after that, blessed are they who do not see, right, but believe. And that would be us this morning if you're born again. You have not physically held the Lord Jesus Christ, but you have handled the Word of God. By faith, you've trusted what God has said without physically seeing Him, and you have received Him as Lord and Savior. So, man, that means you're beloved. You know, God loves you. As much as Jesus needs our fingers and hands in the Word of God, and and He does desire that we handle the Word of God, what He desires even more than that is, is, a, is a just a fellowship in our life. He needs us to have more than just a salvation experience, right? He needs a relationship. He, well, we need a relationship, but he desires that. He doesn't need anything, but he still wants us. And it's amazing. He wants that resurrection power that quickens us the moment we get saved to be, you know, renewed daily. That's why Paul said, I, if Paul died daily, what was that all about? I die daily so that Christ might live. We just sang about it. So that Christ would live full in our life. So too many people today are compartmentalizing Jesus. And so what happens is we become like, well, we become like the Pharisees. You become hypocrites. I become a hypocrite. Why? Well, we, this is what we do. We're one way at church because we, oh, yeah, let's open the door now in fellowship. And then we go another way at work well, that door's shut. And we're another way at home. And then another way at school. Now, hopefully, now hopefully as I say that, you're like, uh-uh, I am who I am all the time, and I'm all for Jesus. Well, I praise the Lord for that. Whew, that's the right answer. I hope that's who we are. But it is possible that this morning I'm addressing somebody who really that is your testimony. And what it is, is you're just not leaving the, you're not fellowshipping with Jesus. It's, it's a religion. Even going to the Bible-believing uh, Baptist church, right? It's a religion and it's not a relationship. And people see that and they're like, dude, you're a hypocrite. And man, oh man, am I familiar with this? Because, y'all, I grew up in an environment where Christians were 
berated as the big H word, right? Hypocrites. That's what I always heard as a kid. Christians are hypocrites. I hear that. I just heard this uh, two weeks ago. I was visiting with a family member. Christians are hypocrites. Well, I are one. So, well, of course we're hypocrites. That's why we needed Jesus to save us. We're sinners, saved by grace. That word doesn't really bother me because that's usually just a cover-up, an excuse, right? Because, you know, everyone's a hypocrite in one way or another. And the church is, is a place for people to, to find Christ. But we should be authentic. We should have a relationship with Jesus that goes be, well beyond the, the amen at the end of the Sunday service. And that's an effort that I can't put forth for anybody. You all got to do that yourselves. And I know many of you do. You're the amen choir. But the Laodicean church... Man, there's some things there that, that do trouble me, and, and I believe that it is, what we see is this hypocrisy. That's what Jesus is pointing out. You say that you're rich and increased with goods, but you're really not, because, you, well, why, why aren't you? Well, you're not really <laughs> fellowshipping with me, and without me, there is nothing. You're empty, you're bankrupt. And so, and so this morning, I pray as we think about these things, that, that if we really truly believe Jesus is Lord, and we've trusted him as our Savior, he will be the center of our lives. He'll be the center of our heart. And, and basically, our lives will not revolve around us, but our lives will re- revolve around the fellowship that we have with him instead of just kind of fitting him into our schedule. Oh, it's time for Jesus. We do that in our family. I, I was actually convicted about that. Uh, uh, you don't want to like pray over meals to the point that it gets religious, but you don't want to get to where it's like, oh, it's time to be like Jesus now and pray. You know what I mean? You want to be authentic. You ought to just, we ought to just be having a relationship with Jesus. And yes, I should be thankful for every drop of food. And I've, I should be extra thankful for all the food that God has given me. But anyway, as we conclude our time this morning, I just want to take a, a look over the second woe. We're not going to have a lot of time to, to tarry this morning. So I just want to look at the second woe in our text in Matthew chapter 12. And we're examining these eight woes. And we've already looked at verse 13. Now look at verse 14 with me. And uh, we're going to read this and ask the Lord to bless uh, the time we have remaining. Uh, The Lord Jesus Christ now speaking, the second woe, let's pick it up in verse 13, read down through 14. He says, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 13, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, uh, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Heavenly Father, we come to your throne this morning as we look at this uh, second woe uh, to these scribes and Pharisees. Lord, we pray that you would just help us uh, see things afresh in our own life. Give us a chance to evaluate our own lives, not think about everybody else, but just to really just examine ourselves and make sure, Lord, that we are uh, spending time in fellowship with you, Lord, and that uh, we would not be the hypocrites that are spoken of by the Pharisees. For we want to be disciples, Lord, followers of you, and, and the disciples struggled enough. Lord, I pray that there be nobody in this room, especially, that uh, is even deceived themselves with religion, and, and they've never even established a relationship with Christ. If that is the case, Lord, I pray that today would even be the day of salvation for that soul. Uh, for we do not want to think that we're rich and increased with goods and have never even met the Lord Jesus. That would be terrible. So, Father, I pray this morning for your word to, ha- to have reign in our hearts, to go forth and do its work, For your honor, for your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name, for his sake, amen. So as we look at this passage, and and we've we've studied 13 and 14 now, um, it's really pretty easy to understand and and, uh, short and to the point. But as Jesus turns and addresses this congregation, and now he's focused on these Pharisees, we saw that first woe, the, the woe that to those who close doors that God wants open in verse 13. And now in verse 14, we see the woe to those who cover covetousness with religious ritual. Those who who, uh, cover covetousness with religious ritual. And uh, man, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses. And I think there's a lot here to look at. I just just want to speak to you briefly about the historical context, the historical context. These religious rascals were taking advantage of widows and covering it with religious edicts. Uh, They were taking their income while offering intercession, right, as a pretense. They made long prayers, uh, it says in, in verse 14. For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. 
So what's that about? You know, I mean, what's going on? Well, they, they would take the substance through their unscriptural additions to the law of Moses. The scribes and the Pharisees were in cahoots on this. And treating them as they were ordinances that were greater than the Bible itself. And, of course, violating the scripture itself, which is what made them hypocrites. And by the time the widow gave uh, what they had demanded, they were destitute. And then what do you do for that poor destitute widow? Well, you make long prayers as if you actually cared. But really, you're just glad you got her cash. And then you pray, right? The poor widow. And, uh, and you pray for the poor destitute widow. And so, and so these scribes and Pharisees were careful to exercise their authority to exact every sin out of the widow while publicly showing their compassion by praying for them at the prayer meeting. Uh, of course, that was heinous in God's eyes. And, and this passage gives us insight to what Jesus told the disciples in Luke 21. In Luke 21 and verse 1, this is a passage that you've heard many times. I've preached it here. It says, And he looked up and he saw rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all, for all these have their, uh, I'm sorry, for all these of their abundance cast in their offerings of God, but she of her penury have cast in all the living that she had. Now we do teach oftentimes this is a passage on sacrificial giving because of the fact that she did sacrificially give. There's no two ways around that. In a historical context, she did that. And there is an inspirational application there um, as well uh, to where we should not just give of our abundance, which is a, that is a, a rebuke uh, of, the, of those rich men. Uh, however, there's not really in that, if you go back and look at that message uh, or that, that account, there's really no condemnation for, or no uh, uh, commendation to her either. Uh, because, well, I don't know why. It's just not in there. But I do tell you what comes after that in the text, and we don't have time to go read it all this morning, but a lot of judgment comes upon Israel <laughs> right after that. And, and Jesus starts lighting into um, telling his disciples about how these walls are going to be torn down, talking about 70 AD. He, start, he starts talking about the destruction, uh, the end times. He's, he just lays all this stuff out. It's kind of a strange thing to start off the chapter talking about this widow's might. But I really believe the reason that Jesus did that is because uh, it was indicative of their relationship with him and what was going on. And, uh, and I think as you study the Bible further, you, you'll find out why. Because we often use that passage to teach of the sacrificial giving. And, and there is, it is awesome to, to give sacrificially. We should do that. Um, but Jesus didn't condone the practice of this widow giving every cent she had at the temple gate. Um, and I, I think I know why. If you have your Bible, turn back to Exodus chapter 22. Turn to Exodus chapter 22. You know, the Bible does say God doesn't see as we see, does he? He sees things a little differently. And he's the one who wrote uh, about how to care for widows. He's the one who knows how all that should go, and he does care for widows. As a matter of fact, in Exodus 22, in verse 22, and it just occurred to me last week, was Isaiah 22, 22, so there might be a pattern here. I don't know. Um, Exodus 22, 22, he says, Ye shall not afflict any widow... Or fatherless child. If ye afflict them in any wise and they cry out unto me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will wax hot. And I, listen to this, and I will kill you with a sword. Whoa, holy moly, what happened to gentle Jesus? I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. Oh, how do you reconcile that with the gentle Jesus? Well, this is the law of Moses, right? And he was setting forth the law, which is both religious and civil because he was establishing a nation and a kingdom. And what you can see from this, you know, honoring father and mother, we take it pretty lightly in our culture. It's a big deal to God. It's a big deal to God. And, uh, and so he establishes this in Exodus 22, and it's with, it's with a lot of... <laughs> severity, right? When you violate that, if you don't take care of the weak and the widow and Jesus, God is not happy with that, especially when you are establishing a nation, 
right? That's been under oppression and they themselves are poor and weak and, and God is himself literally delivering the poor uh, Hebrew slaves out of Egypt, right? Through the Passover and, he's, and he takes them out through the, through the Red Sea and he delivers them in the promised land. I mean, God is demonstrating, God is, uh, he is uh, illustrating his compassion by even delivering the weak and the poor and of course, making the weak strong. So once the weak are strong, what are the weak supposed to do? Have a sensitivity to the weak, right? Because you never want to forget where you come from. I mean, you don't want to forget that you're just a sinner saved by grace. And yet these Pharisees, man, they're running around and something is just not right. And when their own Messiah shows up, they're like, no, we are more righteous than you. And so Jesus tells his disciples, hey, you see that widow? I got news for you. She put in everything out of what she had left. And then he goes on to talk about his wrath. Why? I think because he's thinking about Exodus 22 and verse 22. Because this is not the kingdom the king set up. And that's in part why they didn't want him to come in and take over. Oh, what's that got to do with anything? Well, let me tell you, beloved. It's got a lot to do with a lot in the Laodicean church age. Why? Because Jesus came to save us. Oh, we're all about getting that salvation. We're all about getting out of Egypt. We're all about getting out of bondage. I mean, good night. We got, we got all kinds of emphasis on that. But what about the part where Jesus wants to sup with you and say, hey, now I want you to give. None out of your abundance but sacrificially. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I said I was rich increased with goods, but you, you can have this, you can have my checkbook, you can have my extra, but don't be meddling in my, my life. Okay, I quit preaching, went to meddling. Because that's what the Holy Spirit of God does, and you know it if you're in a Bible-believing church. He steps all over your toes. Because the truth of the matter is he didn't die on the cross just to save me from hell so I could have a good American life. He died on the cross to save me so that, that you and I could make a difference. All of us in this room, if you're born again, he saved you, all of you, right? That means he has all of you. And every once in a while when you interact with him, we do tend to cross our arms like the Pharisees and say, uh, Jesus, you come too far. And I tell you, beloved, that's the difference between revival in a dead, cold church. Because we need Jesus to have all of us. He wants to fellowship with us. In Exodus 22 and verse 23, God, you know what is scary, canary? You know what's scary about this? I don't know why I said that, but anyway. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. And I've never seen this, so I was preparing this message, and I was thinking back on Luke 21, and thinking on this passage in, in uh, Matthew. And I thought, man, you know, I bet Jesus, as he was sitting there, watching that widow give her last pennies, knew, he obviously knows every thought, but he's God. He also was answering her prayer. That's why he was honked off. He's hearing that widow's prayer. And he's listening, and he's like, man, I'm not so happy with these Pharisees, with these Pharisees and scribes, because... I'm hearing prayers that I don't, I, I said in Exodus 22, 23, that I would listen to. Jesus never commended the widow for her gift. In fact, he goes on and on and speaks in, in, in of that coming judgment, just like Matthew chapter 24, which comes after Matthew chapter 23, speaks of his coming uh, in his wrath in the day of the Lord. And so, let me just talk to you a little bit more about how this is manifest in history. <clears throat> you mentioned, a few weeks ago, I mentioned that Babylonian influence that, that Jesus, that I had pointed out. It, it had to do with the phylacteries and the garb and some of the things. There was an, Aaron had a, his priesthood, right? He had his robes and all of those things. But a lot of the things that Jesus himself mentions in the first 12 verses of this chapter look a lot like what you would see in a Babylonian uh, priesthood. And so uh, it could be that they were actually adopting those things, which was uh, anathema, of course, to the Lord Jesus, going all the way back to the Babylonian garment in Joshua. We talked about that. 
And so in Matthew chapter 23 through uh, 23 verses 1 through 12, we discuss that. And it's therefore no uh, surprise that you'll find many liturgical priests, even to this day, doing the very same things that the Pharisees were doing through a system called the indulgence. How many of you have heard of an indulgence before? All right, so a few of you have. Um, uh, This was a system imposed by Rome, and if you were alive about 500 years ago, this would have been on every newspaper. Well, they didn't really have a lot of newspapers. But anyway, this was a big deal because uh, there was a system imposed by Rome that was so grievous to men like Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin in the the 1500s, they broke off from the Roman Catholic Church, and and in part, it wasn't all of it, but in part, it was over a matter of indulgences. Right? So what was that about? Well, for a fee, right, for the right amount of money, you or your dead relative could be prayed out of purgatory. Uh, Like the ordinances, right? Uh, The scribe worked on with the Pharisees that that wasn't anywhere in the Bible, nowhere to be found, but it was still used to exact money from the poor widow. These guys would come up with things like purgatory, doctrines of devils, basically, purgatory, saying, well, look, this is what we'll do. Uh, you know, we know that Uncle Johnny wasn't a very, uh, that's a bad, that's my, my wife's uncle. So let me come with him. Uncle Cliff. I don't have any uncles named Cliff. If it's yours, I apologize. So we know Uncle Cliff. He wasn't a very good guy, right? He was a little edgy. Uh, and we know we love Uncle Cliff, right? So, hey, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, if you just pay me enough money, uh, I'll just go over here and I'll just pray him right on out of purgatory. And I can't promise anything. Because you, let me put the carrot on the stick, right? You got to live a perfect life too. And matter of fact, give me some more money and I'll pray for you too. Because why? Well, I'm the vicar of God. I'm the vicarious representative of Christ on earth. And and, uh, I'm the man. And so you just give to me and I'll take care of it. I'll absolve all the problems for the right amount of money. Well, this, and I'm, you think I'm, you think, you, some of you may think I'm embellishing. I'm actually not at all. This is actually the doctrine. Uh, of indulgence. And so um, it, became a, it became a stench in the nostrils, even of the people, even of the priests uh, in, the, in the Catholic system. They're just like, man, that is not in the Bible, and this is wicked and wrong. And boy, they raised quite a fuss over this thing. And by the way, it caused quite a schism, among other things. So if you study the practice of indulgences, almost anything could be covered for the right price. And I, there's a lot more I'd like to say that, that how this is manifest even today in contemporary culture, but the Holy Ghost said, Brian, no. So I just took all that out of my message. But let me tell you how sticky a subject this is. It's a sticky subject. Because if you're not using an authorized version right now, <laughs> this verse is missing oftentimes in your Bible. In the RSV, the ESV, I think the NIV, they may have put a footnote in it. And what they're going to tell you is, well, verse 14, it doesn't really belong there. Why? Well, because it's not found in any of the ancient manuscripts. No, they don't say that because that's a lie. It's actually found in all the ancient manuscripts except the Vaticanus. The manuscript Tischendorf found in 1500 in a trash can. In the, in the, in the, actually, I don't remember the date. You remember the exact date of Tischendorf's text? Anyway. It was, it was back there. I think it was in the late 1500s, actually. But Tischendorf, this, this guy, found a, a, an old vellum scroll in a monastery, and voila, that becomes the most reliable text because it's supposedly the oldest text, which is a pretty subjective thing to, to consider anyway. But the point being is this. It's, it's not in that text, but it's in every other text. And yet, for some reason, in all the modern translations, that thing is omitted or noted. So I'll take that out of there. Why? Because we don't want to point out the reality of what's been going on and still goes on. One of my friends went to a, a country in, in South Asia and attended a, attended a church, and he was, he was so, uh, a Catholic service, he was so uh, just messed up when he came home, he could not get over the people literally with bleeding knees crawling down the altar uh, and, and the things that they were doing to earn favor with God and putting every, everything they had into a lie. Now, right now in this country, it's not popular to be even so specific. I mean, like Brian, 
you're like stepping on toes and you're talking about other religions. You're not supposed to do that. Well, listen, I'm just doing what Jesus did and calling it like it is. This could go on in a Baptist church too. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying it doesn't matter where you find it. Um, it's not right. And so this passage uh, that we were just looking at, it's not even found in most of the newer texts or most of the new Bibles. Many times they take it out. And I believe it's a cover-up. And if I'm wrong, well, you can talk to me about it later, but I don't think you're going to prove me any different because there's no real reason it shouldn't be in, in every Bible. So the practical application to us as individuals. A few weeks ago, my mother calls, and she says, Brian, I need a ceiling fan put in. And I'm like, okay, Mom, but I'm in a quandary. Because, well, I just told my wife, literally, just like the day before, or two days before, or something, just soon at before... Wife, I'm going to put it in their ceiling fan. Now, her ceiling fan has been in a box in the garage for 15 years because, well, it was a precious ceiling fan that her grandmother gave us, and we had installed in, I think it was our first home, and uh, so it's an old ceiling fan, but it is really a nice, I should take a picture of it. It's a nice ceiling fan, and so uh, she says, like, can you finally put this up, maybe? I'm like, yes, honey, I will do this, finally, and so I literally just make this commitment and my mom says, hey, Brian, can you come and put in a ceiling fan? And I'm like, not this Friday, Mom, but the next. Okay, I want it done yesterday, Brian. I'm sorry, Mom, I'll come in two weeks, I'm sorry. Why did I do that? Well, because I only had two Fridays available, and one Friday was for my wife, who I'm gonna spend the rest of my life with, and the other one was for my mom, who I'm supposed to honor, right? And there's a blessing. And she, by the way, is a widow, so I really do have this responsibility to care for my mom. And so I put that in order, and, and, uh, and it, praise the Lord, it all worked out, didn't it? Did it work out? I think it worked out. Okay, so Amy's fan got put up on time after 15 years of patience. And then the next, the next Friday, my mom's fan got put up on time, and uh, at least within the time frame that I could allot. And that was all good, and she's happy, happy, happy. And so... Um, you know what the reality was? What would it have been like if I have said uh, to my wife, um, honey, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't put up your fan this Friday. I got to go put up my mom's fan. Now, you would have been gracious, I think, but that w- wouldn't that have been a little bit like hypocritical after waiting 15 years and making a commitment? Yeah, it would have been. But what if I had told my mom, mom, I'm sorry, I can't come and, and do yours because I got to do my, my wife. Now, these are, I know you're like, this is, what's the big deal, Brian? Well, let me just share this with you. The reality is this it's my responsibility to ca- take care of both of those fans. Did you say amen? Okay. <laughs> I heard an amen. I'm like, whoa. Uh, why? Because it it's really is my responsibility to do that, right? And, and so, you just do, you work it out. The problem that Jesus was having with these Pharisees is it wasn't their responsibility to take from the widow. It was their responsibility to help provide for the widow. They were supposed to be out of their abundance, right? Giving back. <laughs> It wasn't that they had abundance. God blessed, by the way, in the Old Testament, God blessed Israel. He blessed those guys with wealth to show that he he loved them. I mean, God actually blessed Israel and still to this day blesses them with financial wealth. That's how he works with them. He blesses us with spiritual wealth. And that's why we're to be a blessing with others. And see, you say, well, what's this got to do with the price of tea in China? Well, some of us, we get this salvation and we forget that our salvation is not to be given to us just so we can sit on it and have a good life, the good American life. No, it's given to us so that we can help people that need the gospel. So Jesus says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blinded, naked, not because you don't have money, because you don't have the right value system. Jesus wasn't mad because they they took up offerings or or they had wealth. That really isn't the issue. He actually designed the the priesthood and the system in Israel so all those things would be taken care of. But when we get that upside down, we become a hypocrite. I mean, even today, 
I'm, ta- I'm not talking about the, the Roman Catholic Church, but just recently, and, and I, there's this guy, Stephen Furtick, he kind of comes from a charismatic background, which comes from a prosperity gospel perspective. He just builds this mansion. It's $1.7 million, right? I, and, I, you know, the guy probably preaches a good message, but the problem is a lot of people will not hear him. Wah, 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 wah. Why? Because it's like, dude, are you serious? I mean, and I'm not against the guy, whatever. But he just became a stumbling block to some people. And you can't please everybody. But Corrupted Dollar goes and he literally goes to the church and says, Can you give me $67 million so I can have my private ministry jet? And people are like, No. Why? Because the people who see that the clearest and the easiest aren't in the church. People in the church are like, sure, whatever you say. And, and these guys collect the cash, usually from old people that are dying and have inheritances that they give to them. And they cash in. But the world just sits out there going, that don't look a lot like Jesus. And I'm not saying that these guys ought to be paupers or they shouldn't have anything or they shouldn't even do well or even have a nice home. I'm not, that, again, that's not the issue. But man, we got to have some wisdom. This stuff makes the saved and the non-saved say, what in the world? And so Paul gave us a good verse to handle this. One simple verse in Philippians 4, 5. He says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. You know what would have really helped those Pharisees a lot in their ordinance writing? <laughs> is to consider Exodus 22 and 23 and realize that Jesus, God in their case, Jehovah, Yahweh, was listening to every prayer that every widow was uttering. And he knew exactly where they were at. But you've got to believe that he is, and he's a rewarder then that diligently seek him. So the application of the church. There is a practical application here even. Uh, we here at the church are supposed to care for widows. And it says in 1 Timothy 5, 3, honor widows that are widows indeed. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them at, and let the, the church be, uh, not be charged. Uh, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed, right? And the same principles in effect are and, and apply. So you as a church are not to take care of my mom. I'm supposed to take care of my mom. She's a widow. She's over 60 years old, which is also articulated in the, in the text and in, uh, in 1 Timothy 5. And so uh, it's my job, if I can, to relieve her. So, and then the church then puts their focus on widows indeed that do need relief. So like an example in our church, there's been many widows that we've, uh, assisted families with um, here in the church. And then there's been widows like Phyllis Riddle who literally had no children, had no hair. So it was double duty, Heartland's responsibility to make sure that Phyllis Riddle was cared for uh, when she was uh, alive. Of course, she's passed on. And so the, that, that standard, beloved, is still there today among and in the church and it's something that we obviously need to take seriously. And I think we, as a church, we try to take that seriously. But the church is not to take advantage of the weak, but to care for them. And, get, and God gives us the parameters to do that. That's just the point I'm bringing up. So according to Revelation 1, 6 and 1 Peter 2, 9, right? We are priests and we are kings. We're priests and we're kings. And, and so Jesus tells us that we, we administer a kingdom that's not visible. It's spiritual and in Luke chapter 17 and verse 20 uh, and 21, he talks about how the kingdom of, he- of God does not come with observation, meaning you can't see the kingdom of God. It's no accident the Lord Jesus Christ is calling the church of Laodicea to open the door and sup with him. He purchased us, he owns us, but there are times like the Pharisees that, that we block him out and we can fake it all day long with religious activity. Christian self-help books and Christian entertainment and Christian music. But all the words that include, uh, but in all the words that include Christ, right? Christian this, Christian that. The real issue is, have we been opening the door and communing with God? Because we're priests and kings. We are there to intercede between holy God and a sin-wrecked world. And we have, and we should have, free access. And why does he want us to be drawn in? Why? So we can remember the king's command. 
so that we can fellowship and we can help him with what he's trying to accomplish on the earth. That's the exact opposite of what the Pharisees were doing. So he came and he called his disciples. The word religion is almost a bad word today, isn't it? There's a man that has a video out, this young guy, and he goes and talks about, you know, I want basically Jesus, not religion. And it's a really pretty good video. It really scours legalists. But there is, a, there is a comment that the Lord makes in James about religion. He says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So how we control our tongue controls that. And then he says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is here it is. Notice what he says. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. When there's a definition given, <laughs> it is this definition. Deal with the fatherless children and the widows. The fatherless children and the widows. It, it is interesting, though. The one thing mentioned in the New Testament about religion deals with this. So why is it that important to Jesus? Well, because he heard that prayer, right? He knew. He already wrote Exodus 22, uh, 22 through 24. And And all those things that he promised that would come to pass, they did come to pass against Israel. You see, Jesus was being locked out of their lives. And in doing so, it obstructed him from the very people that he came to save. And some of those very people he came to save, hear me, were those Pharisees and scribes' children. We have a big incentive to be open to the Lord and to fellowship and commune with him and let him in every closet and let him have all of us, beloved. Because the penalty for their hard-heartedness, it didn't just affect those Pharisees that were glad. I just read it in my personal devotional reading. They were glad to betray Jesus with Judas. They were glad, that's the word, glad to betray Jesus. But you know what? They weren't so glad, I'm sure, in 70 AD when their kids were getting their heads lopped off by Titus. Because they rejected Jesus and rejected Jesus and rejected Jesus. Where there is no vision, right, the people perish. Jesus calls us to enter, to answer the door, to sup with him because it's there where he speaks to us. And think about that word sup in Revelation chapter 3. Because when we sup with Jesus, what's he doing? I guarantee you, he's probably having a similar conversation with us that he had with Peter on the seashore, right? And he said with Peter, feed the lambs. Feed the lambs, the little ones. Feed the sheep, feed the sheep. Beloved God is wanting to to have a conversation with us that deals with our eye issues. Not the, the eye of all issues, but the capital eye issue. Say, if we're all so rich, then let's give. Let's give to the lambs. Let's give to the weak. This morning you may be here and it's your first time and uh, maybe you've never considered the fact that Jesus Christ came to deliver you from bondage. He came to deliver you and spring you from a life that is without him destined for hell. Jesus Christ came, the Bible says, to save sinners. Paul said, of whom I'm chief. He was a super religious guy, very religious guy, but yet you know what? He realized that his best wasn't good enough. And that he had to bow before Jesus and thank Jesus for dying for his sin of self-righteousness. Because there's only one person who makes us right with God, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we want to be right with God this morning, we come through the door, and Jesus Christ is the door. So maybe today you've come, and, and for the first time it's occurred to you that you need to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today is the day of salvation. Uh, man, just call out to him. And invite him to come into your heart today, confessing that, you know what, you know that he died on the cross for your sin, that he rose again the third day according to the scripture, and that he's alive today. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he'll save you right now. He'll secure you today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, as we close up this morning, we thank you for this opportunity just to be in your house with your people. We pray a blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word. With heads bowed and eyes closed, as we continue an attitude of prayer, is there anyone under the sound of my voice this morning?